Welcome back to Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Many weeks we talk about birds that you're familiar with, cardinals, bald eagles, blue jays. Other weeks we try and bring a bird that is a little more unknown to mix it up and tell you all about something maybe you haven't heard about before. Oftentimes we try and find something that makes a bird extreme or unique. We've talked about one of the most dangerous birds, or a bird with the longest migration. This week, the Alpine Axe Center is definitely an example of that, and it's for something that you may not be expecting, sex. This is kind of a wild one, so buckle up, grab your binoculars, your eyes wide shut mask, and let's get into it. All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're here to talk about the Alpine Axe Center. So this was a bird that um, I was not familiar with. <laughs> upon researching more, I feel like it seems like there's a lot to t- dive into on this one. I um, picked this bird. Yes. <laughs> I did a thing at the museum on bird sex. And so I started finding random facts about <laughs> birds and sex. And this is the one that blew my mind away the absolute most. So this is a little bit of a not safe for kids um, <laughs> episode, unless you want your kids to learn about the weird aspects the birds of and bird the bees sex. yeah the birds I, and the bees, just, but i don't know yeah so there we go so this will not be polite or clean or tidy or nice <laughs> it's kind of it'll kind of raise your eyebrows awesome as it probably did for you guys when you looked it <laughs> yes. up a bird you'd never heard of i'm nervous and it looks so yeah. boring too right when yeah. you look at pictures yeah. of it, it's like okay what is this thing <laughs> right. is kind of Nothing. Yeah. It's a bland-looking it, passerine bird. Yeah. It kind of looks like a robin and a house finch combined a little bit. I don't know if that's a bad description, but <laughs> for people that haven't heard of them, maybe should we talk a little bit about what it looks like before we get too far into? I, th- I think you just yeah. described them fairly well. I mean, okay. they're not anything to necessarily write home about. They, there's, it's a small family that's called the Prunellidae. They're they often inhabit high elevations. So and they have a pretty a, pretty big range all the way from mm-hmm. Europe to Africa, all the way to across Asia to Japan, yep. and all in high elevations. Yes, yeah, so we have 52 of them in the Field Museum's collections. There have been a lot of subspecies described. And if you look at the things that these things were described on, hmm, mostly based on geography, like uh, Nipolensis, okay, um, Tibetana. Okay, gives you some indication of it, but uh, so there really have been a lot of subspecies. I'm not sure exactly how much actual phenotypic variation there is or how discrete it is. I would guess it's not not that discrete, but it hasn't been studied. So, which is surprising given that at some point in time somebody described. <laughs> Decided to do all the research that we're going to be talking about. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a tough place to go research. So, yeah. What are they? What are they doing up there? <laughs> well, they're breeding at high elevations. That's what they're. Okay. That's what they're doing. Although they do, at, when they're not breeding, they go down in elevation. So you oh, find okay. them around people uh, in the non-breeding season. Okay. So they're not. They're not as enigmatic as peg-billed finch. Okay. For example, they don't disappear like that. Um, they eat insects and seeds. They have grit. They often eat grit. So now we're getting rid of the kind of the normal aspects of their of their biology. <laughs> and they breed from May to August, and they're double brooded, which means they try to have two broods, uh, try to have two nests in a year. And that's as polite as it gets. Okay. Yes. Let's <laughs> um, let's quit beating around the bush. Like, okay. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, yep. yeah. From here on, on. <laughs> warning, warning, warning. Yeah. I'm, leave, the I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. I'll, put, I'll cover your ears. So they are polygynandrous. <laughs> okay. Which is a weird word. Um, yes, it is. But <laughs> it means that uh, bunches of males and females breed together in the same place. So the males are courting the females, the females are courting the males. And so the female is begging and cooing for males, the males are trying to mate with as many females in this group of three to five. So there's all kinds of swapping and yeah. Okay, it's <laughs> not. tell us more, tell us more. <laughs> So how big what? are these groups then that are all 
it looks like they're yeah. three to five on mm-hmm. average working together in their own little sex neighborhood. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, really. There's a huge, they have a really high copulation rate, a thousand per clutch copulations. Whoa. So, yes. I mean that for real. That's a lot. Well, See, I, again, I continue to be completely fascinated as to how somebody actually started realizing. They, had, a, they had to have a counter. There's no way you're like mm. one, two, three in your head, and you're like, oh, shoot. Yeah. I missed one. Oh, no, yeah, look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Getting to a thousand. Putting a counter a thousand times is kind of boring, too. <laughs> so they also have a dominance hierarchy. So there's alpha males and beta males and then helper males that. Delta males. <laughs> How big are these groups? You know, these are the Zeta, sub- Zeta males. <laughs> um, so there's mate guarding again, just like okay. we talked about. Uh, earlier, it just with... doesn't work very well. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it doesn't work very well. So in this bird, because of all the copulations, um, there's competition inside of the female for sperm to fertilize an egg. So, what you do in that point, and you can know that your females are copulating all over the place, and so are you, and you want to try to guard the female, which Mm -hmm. they'll try to do. But then you want your sperm to be the one that um, fertilizes the egg. So what that means is that these birds for their body size have the largest testis during the breeding season of any bird. And it takes up to 8% of their body weight. Oh, Oh, wow. And so if a 200 pound (laughs) man would have a 16 Oh, wow. That's amazing. So you can think about that is just... And so it produces enough sperm that there's competition inside the female. So it wants... So the alpha males are going to have bigger testes, produce more sperm, and in theory then outcompete um, the race uh, to have your sperm fertilizing the egg. Almost all nests are made of birds that have um, different... uh, fathers but the female wants to um the female kind of does this begging thing because she wants males that will help provision the young okay good luck with that this sounds like so human (laughs) yeah you've got a testy that big you're probably not thinking about no but they are that's why they sound human but that's why they guard that's why the males guard the females so the males are only going to feed the ones that they have high confidence in are theirs okay so I don't know how they know this, yeah. whether they're the last she sperm they think that goes in there. Yeah, right. Sure she does. <laughs> um, Believe me, honey. <laughs> he's got your eyes. These are yours. Yeah, he's got your eyes. Can't you see me begging? <laughs> are the, um, me and Amanda were trying to look this up and we couldn't find an answer. Are the the um, testes, like, do birds have exterior or interior or where are they? They're, yeah. Inside. I, okay, okay, that's what we figured. But, often okay. only one of them in the breeding season develops big. Okay. So if you, uh, outside of the breeding in season. In the ag centers. Yeah. Yeah. That's Outside of the breeding season, you might see two, but in this case, only one of them grows to be that giant. Okay. Rest of a, okay. okay. Of a and thing. So you wouldn't see it. So, because I was looking for pictures. <laughs> and <laughs> well, I could not. You can't see. <laughs> couldn't see anything. Yeah. So, but. We did read about uh, protuberances. Mm-hmm. Tell us, Shannon. No, you tell me. <laughs> no, no, you're the Good expert. Enough. <laughs> no, I, I, they, we want to hear it from the expert. No, I'm not an expert in them. You're the. I just did a lot of research for my bird sex. That you're the um, Dr. Ruth of birds. <laughs> she didn't she just die? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're the living. No, Dr. I'm really, I'm really not. <laughs> no, but tell us about, or somebody tell us. That's what I was most I mean, interested co- co- in. Cloacal protuberances are not uncommon in the breeding season. Oh, so, so other bird? So that's not a something. Not a big to deal. The, uh, so it, yeah, and it's it's it's. But it's they're not inter- usually this big. Okay. It's an interesting thing because you can, in the height of the breeding season, often tell males from females in non-dimorphic. Uh, species looking at the size of the cloacal protuberance. Okay. Oh, okay. But so, so, but it but it is interesting in birds because so much of this is internal okay. for the most part. Okay. And and coming back to testes, as Shannon's saying, like it's unusual to have a situation where only one testes 
testis develops. Um, but one of the things that definitely happens in birds very commonly is that testes regress in the non-breeding season to the gonads to, to a large extent, or to the, the ovaries to a large extent, and then uh, begin to expand in the, in the breeding season as the breeding season comes along. So, of course, I had to look up their name. Um, so, col cholaris means of the net, then of the neck, and accenter um, means someone who sings with others, which uh -huh. I think is pretty interesting. And prunella, the um, genus name, comes from German. It means brown, basically. So, it's a good mixture of of what they are and do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> wait. So, I'm trying to wrap wrap my head around. So, how do the other birds know which male has the biggest testy? Really good question. Okay. <laughs> they are probably seeing who's having more copulations. Oh. And there's there could be, they're not competing for food, you know, so we think of competition for a resource like food, but they're competing for um, females as the resource. And so the dominance hierarchy, usually if you watch for very long, the dominance hierarchy becomes really clear. Um, who is like big dogging it in into the front of the line, right? <laughs> and and who's not? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's what happens if you're fitter and however you define fitness, um, you know. And females are clearly looking for birds that will help. And so if you're bigger, if you look stronger, if you sing louder, if you have fewer parasites, whatever it is that the birds are used, that female birds are using to distinguish the quality of their mate could be a cloacal protuberance, for example, okay. which could, you know, could indicate a larger testes. I don't know how that relationship oh. works. I don't know. So that was on the, I thought that was on the female. That's on the male, the protuberance? So, so both both have them. Okay. But but the female has a, a shallower one than, oh. than, than males do. Okay. So okay. it's not a penis. Some people think it's a penis. I mean, some birds do like ducks indeed have that but yeah. that's not what this is okay do the groups so they have like this hierarchy is it the same group every mating season or do they switch up or do we know i don't know that yeah. but they know a little bit about it because they've been able to mark you know color band birds so that they can keep track of things but i'll, be, I'll bet yeah. part of it is that there's some level of instability in the sense of birds not making it through the year. And and, and so uh, there's going to be a kind of a constant uh, changeover in, in, in yeah. all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. and as you get old, if you're a male bird, so say you're a really good alpha male now and you have the beta and the subordinates just waiting for you to kick off or get so old you can't do what you were used to doing so that they can ascend to um, to becoming alpha males and get more of copulations in a, in a population. So you know, you can I only maintain your dominance for so long. I was thinking about what the would be if your testy suddenly weighed X percent of your body weight. <laughs> it's definitely going to slow you down over time. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of energy when you think about it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a lot of energy to have a thousand copulations yeah. and, to, um, and to spend that much time guarding yeah. uh, your female. So I can imagine it's like the... I don't think there's been a movie that's been as that's involved people that has been as dramatic <laughs> as as they actually are on an annual basis during the breeding season. That's actually we should be writing uh, that that movie, that movie. Like, another, another movie you know. script to put on the list. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I don't think there's a rating for uh, that one that would. <laughs> I think that one will be a big hit. <laughs> I, I like the title though, Accenter. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Just like one word. People yeah. like remember that. that. That's an awesome title. <laughs> so what? what is an accent? Or <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Shannon, what is you that word? Yeah, so <laughs> awkwardly pivoting. <laughs> accenter means someone who sings with others. Oh, that's oh, right. Okay. okay. So, so, perfect. Okay. The sweet side of that whole um, equation. It can be a equation. musical. Yes. Oh, yeah. A musical. <laughs> is accenter, it, yes. the musical. Well, they do They do spend a lot of time vocalizing. So maybe. Is it sings or swings? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, there we go. There's, there's, the, there's the, the, yes. the tagline. Sings or swings. <laughs> if it sings, it swings. <laughs> Wait, so do, do all accenters then, not just the alpine accenters, have this um, 
I yeah this system the, yeah I'm sorry what is that's the poly- a that's a good question and I'm actually I mean not I don't sure think Dunnicks what do Dunnicks do they, Dunnicks is their I think their closest living relative they've been studied they do a ton of weird stuff yeah <laughs> so it's in their genes okay 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 but and, it works it, yeah. yeah it works from a you know they've been around for millions of years yeah mm-hmm. and that a thousand capulations what's the time <laughs> like how, is that over how long is that are we talking 10 well, minutes I mean, they, they do double brood they breed from um you know they they have a normal breeding season then they raise two broods so okay that's all they're doing <laughs> no they, they they're eating in there some somewhere yeah okay. i don't know how much they're eating i'm but, interested in the like if a male wants to copulate as much as possible, but he also has to guard the females. Right. There's like, a trade off there yeah. that, that doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Yeah. So if you can do both of those things, you're the male that the female wants. Okay. Because you're likely to have enough energy to provision her young. <laughs> See, and, and but then there's, I, I bet you there's not a single nest that only has one father. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. I mean, extra pair. I don't even know what a pair See, is, but, right? But, yeah. but but I've always said in in th- this was something that was really fascinating when when genetic techniques to be able to assess parentage um, came available. One of the things they showed with passerine birds was that the frequency of extra pair copulations was upwards of thirty to forty percent in almost everything mm. they looked at. Wow! And people always kind of use that to talk about how promiscuous they uh, they were. But coming back to this whole accenter problem, I mean, one of the things I always thought was, yes, but most birds actually have strong pair bonds, and that's because males need or, or uh, you need two individuals to raise young, effectively, in in a lot of situations. And so, what you don't see across the majority of birds is a complete breakdown in the mating system. And so, even though the the Male only has a thirty percent chance, or, or or what sixty percent chance of knowing that he's the parent. It's still worth it for them to mate with a male or with a female, feed the young in that nest. I think in part because you've just only got so much time to raise young over the course of your lifetime, and 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 so your your pair bonds aren't going to break sure, down. But if that. if this is how you're living in a commune a sex commune you're not going to think <laughs> that, well, that your your pregnant uh, uh, significant other's baby is necessarily yours it's pretty clear you're not thinking at all at that point so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no time wait so i'm wondering i get the john when you're saying extra pair is that does that mean Yes. So, 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 if you if you look at the chicks in the nest, okay, it, it it's and it 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 really actually implies primarily to male parentage. Okay. In other words, so 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 upwards of thirty percent of the chicks in that nest were not sired by the male okay. that's feeding at the nest. That's... And and again, it's it's an interesting figure and and. One of the interesting things about birds is you'll find these species like accenters where they take it to a whole radical direction. Um, but at the same time, most of the species of songbirds are actually pairing up and raising a set of young, even if there's a possibility that not all those young belong to the male. Okay. They, they still have a pair bond there that the pair bond itself doesn't break down. And the interesting thing about these accenters is there's definitely a, a pair, sort of a pair bond, I guess. I, I, it's, and what do you do? What do you, yeah, it's an interesting question. Hmm. What do you call that? Yeah. I, I don't know, because <laughs> if you, what's that show where, where there's a <laughs> husband with a whole bunch of wives? <laughs> oh, uh, is it sis, sister, sister, sister wives? wives? Is that what it's <laughs> called? I mean, the I've guys, the number, <laughs> the, the guys, the number one thing. The females rotate in and out. They get old. He tosses them out and gets a younger one who becomes the primary. I, mean, I don't know. No, I, I haven't I, actually watched that show. I've never had it. It creeps me out. I, I keep, I keep thinking about like 
so we've talked about like the flame bower bird who spends all this effort building this structure mm-hmm. to entice a mate. It takes all this time and there's the one that comes over and then it's about to happen. And then somebody else offers a blueberry and it doesn't happen. And it's like his whole life is building up to this. And meanwhile, there's the extenders that are like a thousand times. Like, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a whole lot of effort for them. Because the females are right there. <laughs> yeah. and the male, yeah, no, I mean, talk about the polar extremes yes. opposites. Biology is <laughs> variable. Yeah, they definitely are. And across birds, there's all kinds of other examples of really interesting skews associated with stuff. So there's a lot of weird bird sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. Yeah. In, in, in these long tailed mannequins in Costa Rica, they have these alpha and beta males and they dance for to attract females. So it's kind of like the bowerbird system. But when the female comes in, if she's interested, the beta male kind of disappears and the alpha male mates with her. And there have been data sets put together that have suggested that a single male is accounting for 95% of the populations in the community. Like he's clearly wow. the best dancer. The females love it. But and all those other males help him dance. There's something called a popcorn dance. You should look up videos. It's really Yeah, we can, we can talk about this bird at some point. But, um, but it's... it's but, yeah, so the they idea are hopping of, up and down, and obviously these accessory males are helping this alpha male while, I imagine, anthropomorphically, waiting for him to die mm. <laughs> so that there can be competition because right. that is a huge biological advantage. Yeah. Mm. That is a fitness advantage. Wow. You have all these things that are helping you be really attractive, and you're just waiting in the wings for your for your chance. Your well, time. learning how to dance. Like Tanya Harding and, and Nancy yeah. Kerrigan. <laughs> <laughs> but so 95%? Yeah. Yeah, are, for, for, for a period of time. That's you know, crazy. Again, maybe a couple breeding seasons. Okay. But but if you do, and again, these, these, are, these are one thing I also, I have a lot of respect for the people that take the time to go out and mark these birds and follow them around and figure all this stuff out because it's, it's not trivial <laughs> and 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 so it's these are yeah it's it's an interesting world out there yes yeah. and we get peeks into it because of technology cameras and video high speed videos you get in, insights into things that you know even 30 years ago you couldn't do even 20 years ago well, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else about that? I wanted I'll to ask. Haven't where? you done yeah, There's, there's, there's <laughs> a lot more to ask. Yes, I, this yeah, is man, my. I was <laughs> so psyched for this. <laughs> yeah. So, where is the the protuberance? Yes, where on the bird is it located? Underneath the tail. Okay. On the body. Okay. So, that's what. And I, that's again, if we go back to other things, that's where pee and poop comes out. Oh, okay. Too. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that happen inside that space. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so it's all the same. One house. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Some people are into that. <laughs> Who, Amanda? Who? So is it when the accenters copulate, is it just like their two yes. m- meeting? Yeah, we, we, which, which is, which is an, kind of bizarre when you think about the the fact that they're in the same place on both Males and females, yes. how, do you, how do you, you... There's lots of ways if, uh, yeah. that birds do that. Some people even do it on the wing. So they're flying and they <laughs> they do that. That seems almost easier to me. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, I mean, the, the male mounts the female. Does he stay there? What? While they're in the so, air? Yeah, well, wow. yes. That's, <laughs> that's Swift, amazing. Swifts will make that way. Really? That's yeah. wow. awesome. <laughs> I, I, it's like... The idea of it, that the the fact that it works is still mind boggling. Yeah, to me. seriously. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we do have a mailbag question. Oh yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a big transition. Actually. This is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, this is from from one of our loyal listeners, Ariana from ah. Logan Square. So she's definitely made it through all the way to this point for her, uh, <laughs> all the way to her mailbag question. Hope she likes accenters. Yeah, it's, it's going to be her new favorite bird. Um, so she says, uh, is it possible to keep a pet bird in an ethical manner? I've read about wing clipping um, common for pet birds, and it sounds incredibly cruel. 
Even if you don't clip a pet bird's wings, though, is it fair to keep them confined in a home? I feel curious about how this applies to zoos and sanctuaries as well. And then she also just had a note. Um, Random, I recently took a little trip to see a friend in St. Louis, and she was kind enough to indulge my birding hobby. We went to the Riverlands Audubon Center about 30 minutes outside of the city there, and it was an incredible spot for migratory birds. Just thought I'd share. Oh, cool. Neat. Well, that's the easy part. (laughs) I'm glad. I hope you had a good time. (laughs) I mean, this is actually a really... I struggle with this um, a lot because for someone who grew up the way I do, zoos, I was in awe of zoos. This is the only way I could see anything, right? Mm -hmm. It's the only way I could travel the world with live things. Picture books sufficed. But I remember we went on a camping trip down the... uh, the Pacific Coast, and we went to San Diego, and we went to the San Diego Zoo, and I, I, I didn't even know a place like that existed, mm-hmm. you know. And it was incredible the idea that I could see an elephant and a giraffe and just all of these, all of these exotic animals from all over the world in one place. So, from that perspective, it makes you care. Convinced me to be a biologist, those kinds of things, and now dedicating part of your life to preserving biodiversity so those are they're connected often but and zoos have gotten much more humane in how they handle and where they get their animals from so do I want to see zoos go away no but I do understand why people do Hmm. Um, but you know there's kids that grow up fairly poor like me who are not going to go to the jungles of Africa to see an elephant and there's something about seeing the real thing so so they, they serve a purpose, and I think they have a lot of conservation efforts and research efforts that are really important mm-hmm. for native birds. So most zoos have research programs that are not just geared towards caring for um, the animals that, that are in their zoo, but that are trying to understand how to keep um, wildlife protected and alive in the wild. Yeah, and, That and, being and, said... And, and they're, they're much much they're really well networked these days in other mm-hmm. words they they work collectively across the the zoo community in in ways i think that make a big difference for animal welfare and things that being said um i do not believe in taking birds from the wild and keeping them in your house there are just like there are cats and dogs that need adoption there are a lot of birds that need adoption as well people have brought them into captivity then they you know, the most common thing I think that gets asked is, what are you going to do with them? Well, I'm going to let it be free. Well, birds that have grown up around people can't be free. They have no ability to be that bird in the wild. They think cats are their friends, mm. right? If mm-hmm. you if you have pets in, their, in your house, it, it's not going to be afraid of a cat. Mm-hmm. It doesn't know how to eat mm-hmm. outside. It doesn't even know what its bird behavior is supposed to be like. It doesn't know how to find a mate. So what are you doing when you let it in? When you bring it in, you have to have a commitment to that bird. And you shouldn't just think the bird's going to live for a a year or something like that. If you bring a parrot into your house, that thing can outlive you. Hmm. So that's something you're potentially passing on to your children or your grandchildren. So you have to think hard about whether you have the personal and financial resources. Because it's not okay to just let things out. I mean, look what's happening to Florida with all the pythons that have been left out. It's yeah. insane. So so I, I do. It's hard. Mm-hmm. I don't. I, and personally, I don't want a bird as a pet. Even. No, but you had a crayfish. I had a, yeah, I had a crawfish. <laughs> mm-hmm. It ate fish. It was nature red in tooth and claw. The crawfish was awesome. <laughs> um, what was its name? It didn't have a name. Oh, okay. So, Sebastian. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think it did have. I don't think we ever. Yeah, was, uh, but uh, no. I mean, those no. are. That's a. It is. It's a. It's a interesting question, and obviously, mm-hmm. there are lots of people that take really good care of their animals, and there are other people that don't, and that's one of the tragedies of all of it when it comes right down to it. I mean, if you take parrots in, parrots again, super smart, big brained, long lived they create bonds with the people they're with. And so if you dump them out in the wild, 
they're going to be despondent and depressed. And you Mm -hmm. can see that. One of our students, Taylor, who we'll have on sometimes, studies parrots. He has parrots himself. And they become extremely dependent Mm -hmm. and emotionally vested in you as a person. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can keep this bird around for a couple of years and then you get bored of it or your kids get bored and you're just going to let it go outside, that has enormous consequences for the individual. Okay, we think about individual thinking. So most of the stuff I've talked about is emotional thinking about an individual's uh, fate. Um, And what we really should be thinking about is population thinking. And so when you let that one individual out because you want it to be free, you don't know what that thing's going to do in the environment, what Mm -hmm. parasites it's bringing from wherever it came from, what it's going to do to native species that don't deserve um, humans to be dumping new new competitors, competitors and, in in their in their midst and so that's not okay and most people are just not responsible enough hmm. so i don't know would you have a pet bird i mean no not personally but no i don't think so either yeah. you I have mean... an mallard rj <laughs> no <laughs> they're no, they might be spying spy. on him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's, not, he's not falling for that yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, here, take this mallard. I don't know. <laughs> I we never had we never had birds growing up. Did you have birds? Nope. Yeah, I don't know if I have ever known anyone that did. I haven't either, but I know when we've gone to PetSmart, they have the mm-hmm. cages with the birds and I can see I can definitely see the appeal of having this beautiful thing in your home that you form a connection with and that sings and I I totally see why it it would be attractive you know yeah I think it would be fun but it would be yeah not fun for the bird yeah (laughs) I mean as far as wing clipping goes I know that seems cruel I don't know that that's true oh yeah that's an interesting yeah but birds molt their wing feathers so you can cut them and if you decide not to cut them they'll They'll grow back the next time to be real feathers. Oh. So it's not, you're not, when you cut, when you snip the feathers, you're not cutting bones or anything. At least you shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, the, the big thing is the reason you do that is. So they don't fly. But, but because if they do fly, what's going to happen to them once they get out is right. probably a pretty short lifespan yeah. where. They hit the a next Cooper's, with a cat. The next in, Cooper's hawk comes along. And, right. Uh, Wait. So when you're clipping a bird's wings, it's a contin like you're you have to do it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't okay. realize that. I, I thought that it was either. a permanent. I thought it was permanent. I, I just too. didn't know. I mean, okay. Feathers grow and they grow back, but feathers molt. This mm-hmm. is part of the natural cycle of birds. I yeah, was right. I was, there was a project in uh, southern Arizona for a while where they were trying to reintroduce a species called thick-billed parrot, and they would get them out of the pet trade that that had these clipped wings. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to re-release them into the wild. And, and one of the things they could do is uh, a technique that I was blown away by called imping, which is basically just taking that feather shaft that's left when the bird's wing is clipped and putting in, gluing in another feather of a molted from another bird in such a way that you can actually get them to be able to fly again. Oh, wow. And then they'll uh, gradually molt out and molt in new feathers after that so there's some wow. crazy oh, techniques that people have awesome. figured out over the years in those situations but you know there are lots of birds that hit the windows in chicago for example and they end up at a rehab center and a lot of those birds can be adopted if you want to if you want wow. to do that so uh, because those birds might have a broken wing and they'll never be able to live um free and wildlife if they can be rehabbed and let go that the centers will but you know, there are other ways to have a pet bird than taking something from the wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, I know, Shannon, something you said reminded me in Steamboat, there was an optometrist office. It was like in Central Park Plaza. And they had, I think it was an African gray parrot in mm-hmm. the office. And I remember the first time I went to get eyeglasses there, um, I asked, like one of the techni- technicians working there and she said like we inherited that with the business like this if you s- sign a lease for this unit you have to Take adopt the parrot. that parrot 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th- those, I, those birds can live 70, 80 years. That's probably. what she said. She said yeah. this bird could live to 80, so it has to just like be part and, of the arrangement. <laughs> well, and, and what I wonder in those situations, one thing we don't really have any idea is, you know, we've been talking about the attachments that can evolve is how do those birds deal with, with, reattaching and and things like that and and animals can die of broken hearts for sure mm. Mm. yeah well thanks for the question ariana <laughs> that's such a downer. yeah should we lighten it up for we go from i was just trying to think of, to, yeah yeah we'll do do we want to transition to axe hunters after that <laughs> yeah yeah back to <laughs> I, i'm curious what she thinks yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, Ariana, send us a note and let us know what you think because we're kind of curious about yes. it as well. Because so. it is a really hard question. Yeah. When yeah. You are like me and you love a zoo mm-hmm. so much and right. you think of them being confined. Mm-hmm. Right. No. I wanted to circle back to zoos real quick, Shannon. There was something that I was thinking about when you were saying that. And I used to kind of feel like, not anti zoo, but just, you know, feel kind of like the animals were confined, even though that. I think they're taken really good care of. But someone explained to me that, you know, just with the way things are out in the wild right now, too, that there's so many things that are endangered and are having their habitats taken away that a lot of times zoos are the only places where you can actually, like, see an animal, too. There's animals that are going extinct, and I think zoos play an important role in actually, like, preserving animals as well. Um, so I don't know. Someone told me that one time, and it stuck with me, so I just wanted to point that out, too. Yeah, there's there's kind of amazing examples. So. California condors are an interesting example of not of a bird that was brought into captivity for any other reason than there were just a few of them left. But the San Diego Zoo played a big part in Mm -hmm. figuring out how to get California condors to actually reproduce in a situation where it's a bird that doesn't reproduce. They're not act centers. They're not Mm -hmm. copulating a thousand (laughs) times, you know, and so... And it worked. And if you had told me that that there were something like six condors left in the wild when they brought the last six in, and there were several others in the already in captivity, and now they've been able to actually successfully raise a whole bunch of chicks that have now gone out and have been reintroduced into the Grand Canyon and parts Jeez. of California. I mean, I think it, you know it's a long ways from necessarily knowing you have a stable population of California condors. But at the same time, it's 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 worked, and so mm. things like that the definitely happen. The Living oh, Coast yeah. has a relationship yeah. with the San Diego Zoo that's really important, yeah. mm-hmm. um, and a lot of expertise. There are lots of scientists at zoos, mm-hmm. just like there are lots at museums, and most people just don't think about it. So it's yeah. not just animal husbandry. You know, there's people actively looking at the genomics and genetics of these birds, things having to do with food and diet and hormones and and reading biology and trying to figure out how you make environments, how you preserve environments in the wild and how you make environments in a zoo that are more realistic hmm. um, for the birds or well, for the animals that you have in captivity. Hmm. And I always remind myself that they often know a lot about some of these details associated with behavior because mm-hmm. they're around the animals all them. the time. And yeah. so they can hmm. learn things about courtship and feeding and other aspects of the biology of these birds that in the wild, people just aren't going to know. Mm. I mean, That's the Lincoln Park really Zoo cool. has some really great scientists. So does mm. the Brickfield Zoo, mm. yeah. including mathematical modelers that are modeling population dynamics, you know, that are also on the Committee on Evolutionary Biology, the way John and I are. So they have oh, relationships cool. with students and train students. And so it, zoos aren't what they used to be yeah. and they're not yeah. what most people think they are yeah. mm-hmm. you know there's deep amounts of research that goes on in in zoos there's usually conservation biology centers the mm-hmm. Smithsonian zoos have um, a lot of fantastic people working behind the scenes very cool we did it we, we brought it back to positivity <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> alright well John do you want to close it out on this one yeah so let's boy this one is a tough one <laughs> Um, <laughs> high mountain birds do a lot of weird things <laughs> and accenters are a good example <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us we appreciate it if you have a question for us you can reach us at podcast.birdsofafeather at gmail.com if you've been enjoying our podcast please leave us a review and rating in your podcast app 
This goes a long way with helping us get exposure, so if you don't mind, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks to Earhole Studios in Chicago for helping us record, and see you all next week. We love you all.